Hallelujah. My, my, my. Such a great price paid for my <coughs> salvation. Turn with me tonight to the book of Lamentations, the third chapter. Lamentations, the third chapter. What we're going to talk about tonight is mentioned in the Bible 276 times. It's something that every one of us have experienced in our life. If you're out there under the sound of my voice and you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have experienced it. If you're out there under the sound of my voice tonight and you're a Muslim, you have experienced this. This is something that all of mankind has in common. Jew, Greek, Gentile, saved, unsaved, Christian, Muslim. Doesn't matter what religion, doesn't matter what faith, doesn't matter what race you are, doesn't matter what nationality you are. Every one of us have experienced this right here. This right here has played a big part in every one of our lives. We would not be here tonight without it. The Bible says in Lamentations, the third chapter, the 22nd verse, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm going to read that again. It is of the Lord's mercies. That word mercy there means the, the withholding <coughs> of judgment that one deserves. Are you with me? The Lord's mercies that are, that it's because of His mercies that we are not consumed or destroyed. Because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithful where would we be tonight without the mercy of God? Like I said, whether you're out there tonight and you, whether you know Jesus or whether you don't know Jesus, you have experienced His mercy because it's by, only by His mercy that you're still alive. It's only His mercy if you've denied Him. It's only His mercy that's allowing you another chance to accept Him. If you did not live for Him yesterday, it's only His mercy that gave you another day to make that choice to live for Him. If you're alive tomorrow, it'll be because His mercy and His compassion was new again in the morning for you and gave you another opportunity to accept Him, to live for Him, to choose Him. Amen? And there are some people where this message came from. There are some people that I'm praying for now. Their life is a mess. Amen? They are not living for God. They're not doing anything for God. They're not giving anything to God. Their life is turned upside down and nothing but turmoil. And many times I have stood in prayer with the Lord in my conversation with the Lord and said, Lord, I don't know how to pray for these people. They're not living for you. They're not doing anything for you. They're not giving anything to you. They're not even acknowledging you, but how am I going to pray for them? I know how to pray for them. <clears throat> I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray that God has the same mercy on them that he's had on me. I'm going to pray that God has shows them the same grace and the same mercy and deters the judgment that they deserve the same way he has me. I'm going to pray for them that in the morning his mercy is new for them just like I want it to be new for me. I'm going to pray for God to have mercy on them. It's easy for us to sit back tonight and say they deserve what they're getting. It's their fault. It's because of them. They deserve what they get. Yeah, well, who don't? Amen? How many messages, messes have you ever got into in your life? And whose fault was it? Amen? And what did you do? You cried out for God to have mercy on you. Why is it so easy for us to ask for mercy for ourselves, but so hard for us to give mercy to someone else. Amen. So what am I going to pray for? I'm going to pray, God, let your mercy intervene. Don't let them die in their sins. 
Let your mercy intervene and give them a space to repent. Let your mercy intervene and allow your spirit to draw them, to pull them. I'm telling you tonight, I've heard people in my, in my over my years of ministry and living for the Lord, they've said, I'm not going to pray for that person again. Shut up. That's wrong. Never, ever stop praying for somebody. I know sometimes it seems like you're praying for people, and instead of them getting better, it's getting worse. And there'll be some holy saint of God come along to you and say, I just wouldn't pray for them no more. It's just up to the Lord now. You've prayed enough. Oh, somebody, some people need, like I said before, get locked, y'all. We should never quit praying for people. Never give up on anybody. Never quit calling out for the mercy of God for that person. How would you like it tonight if God's mercy was cut off from you? It's so easy sometimes for you to stand with, and, and say, that person deserves stoning. Yeah, it's easy to say if you're the one with the stone in your hand, amen, instead of the one that's standing in the way of judgment. Because when you're standing in the way of judgment, trust me, you don't want to stone it. You, you want God's mercy to intervene. But many times it's hard for us to pray, God, have mercy on we, You know what we want to do most of the time? We don't want to be breaking down with the rubber meets the road. God, strike them dead. Put something on them, Ajax won't take off. Oh, but just pour judgment out on them. I tell you what, our old flesh is quicker to pray that than it is to pray God have mercy on them. Amen? God have mercy on them. God intervene in this situation. Stand in the way of judgment. That's what mercy does. Have you ever heard somebody say they're going to throw themselves on the mercy of the court? You know why they do that? They're guilty. They're guilty. So they throw themselves on the mercy of the court into the hands of a just judge and expect that if they do that, maybe he'll be lighter with them. Maybe he'll be more soft with them, with the judgment that he's pouring out. That's what we did when we came to an old-fashioned altar. There was no justification inside of us. There was no righteousness inside of us. We could not stand before God and say, I deserve your mercy. We had to throw ourselves on the mercy of the court. Hallelujah. And when we did that, Mercy intervened, and mercy stepped in, and mercy forgave us, and washed us, and cleansed us, and brought us up out of the miry clay, and set our feet on the rock to stay. Why is it so hard for us to want that for other people? We want it for us. Why is it so easy for us to sit back on the telephone, or just out in conversation, and say they deserve what they're getting? Well, honey, you better be glad that we don't get what we deserve. Amen. None of us deserve the mercy of God. That's what mercy is all about. That's what grace is all about. I told you the definition for mercy. It means withholding judgment that one deserves. Grace, we've talked about before, means the unmerited love and favor of God. Do you know what unmerited means? That means you haven't earned it. That means, you have, that means there's nothing you have done that has caused you to be in favor with God other than calling on Jesus and being washed in His blood. Isaac Thomas. It's important enough that God wanted us to hear tonight that all of us need mercy. Every morning, every one of us need the mercy of God. Every day, all of us need the mercy of God. And we throw, him, we throw ourselves on the mercy of the Lord and we cry out for Him to forgive us and for Him to have mercy on us. Yet we're so ready to cut off everybody else. I'm not going to read it to you tonight, but we could talk about Jonah. And we could talk about how that he ran from God. He disobeyed God. He went down, got in the ship, headed to Tarshish. God sent a storm. He wound up in the belly of the whale. What does he do when he's in the belly of the whale? He cries out for the mercy of God. He cries out for God to deliver him, to forgive him, for mercy to intervene where he didn't deserve it. Did he deserve mercy? He didn't deserve God showing up and delivering him. He's the one that ran from God. He's the one that disobeyed the voice of God. He didn't deserve mercy. But what happens? God intervenes. God has mercy on Jonah. He allows the fish to spit him up and gives him a second chance. Says, now get up, arise, go to Nineveh. Tell them, tell them the word of the Lord. Tell them to repent. So what's he do? He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. He tells them to repent. Guess what they do? They repent. Guess what Jonah's reaction is? He gets mad. Why? Because God showed them the same mercy that he showed to him when he was in the belly of the whale. We don't find Jonah being angry whenever he come up out of that whale's belly. Amen? Oh, he's shouting the glory then. 
Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. Amen. But the minute God shows mercy to His enemies, He gets mad. Because He doesn't feel like the Ninevites deserve mercy like He does. Brother Billy, what in the world does that have to do with us? You think about it for a minute. Chew on that for a little bit. <clears throat> think about the mercy that God has had saving you, filling you with His Spirit, bringing you to a place where you can hear the truth of the Word of God. And you think about the way you deal with others or your attitude toward others. Think about it in your lifetime. Have you ever thought, well, they deserve what they're getting? It's their fault. Amen. Every one of us have thought that. Every one of us has either said it out loud or we've said it to ourselves. They deserve what they're getting. When we ought to be saying, God, please let your mercy intervene on their behalf just like you did for me. Hallelujah. Let your mercy be new for them. Let your compassions not fail them. Let it intervene. Let your mercy intervene for them. Give them a space to repent. God, don't let them be cut off. Let them repent and get saved. Let them get right with you before it's too late. Amen. Let your mercy intervene for them. So Jonah gets mad and he's complaining and murmuring and all that. And you can read Jonah the fourth chapter and God shows him a picture that doesn't get a whole lot plainer than he allows a gourd to grow and gives him shade. And Jonah's happy again. Why? Because God had mercy on him. Are you listening to, the, to what God's saying? God had mercy on him again. He was happy. What happens? Along comes a worm, eats on the gourd, kills it. Amen? Then Jonah's mad again. Sounds like us, don't it? Things is going our way, we're happy and jumping the pew. When they ain't, we just get mad. Amen? We deserve better than that. Why does this stuff have to happen to me? That's the way Jonah was. <clears throat> He was mad because God didn't have mercy on him and leave the gourd for his shade so that the sun wouldn't beat down on his head. But he wasn't happy that God had mercy on him. Matter of fact, you know what he told God? He said, I knew you would do this. Amen? Listen to what he said. Ain't going to read it all, but I read this too much to you. Jonah, the fourth chapter, the first and second verse. It displeased Jonah, it, it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. What was That God spared Nineveh. He had mercy on it. Now, where was this anger when God had mercy on Jonah? Wasn't no, wasn't no anger whenever God had mercy on Jonah. Not by Jonah because he's happy when God had mercy on him. Maybe he thought he deserved mercy, but the Ninevite, Ninevites didn't. I got this way. None of us deserve mercy. None of us. He was angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country? Therefore I fled before unto, Tarsh unto Tarshish. For I knew that I had a gracious God. What's he saying? And merciful. Slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. Meaning I knew that whenever they repented, you would spare them. Well, when he repented, God spared him. See, it's easy for us to want mercy. It's hard for us to deal it out. But the Bible says the merciful shall obtain mercy. Amen. We must first learn to have mercy, to pray for mercy for other people. What did Jesus do when he was hanging on the cross? He prayed for mercy. For who? For you. For those that had crucified him. He looked down on them and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did. What was he doing? He was praying for mercy. Did they deserve forgiveness? No. If you were standing there and you saw what they did to your Lord and Savior, there ain't no way you'd think they deserve mercy. <clears throat> Read it, and you don't think they deserve mercy. That is what mercy is all about. Mercy is about the judge giving you something you don't deserve, a pardon, forgiveness, deliverance, a healing. What blind Bartimaeus holler as Jesus passed by? Now, son of David, have mercy on me. He was a beggar. He was filthy. He didn't deserve it. But he knew if he cried loud enough, if he hollered out, that's where we are. We know if we cry loud enough, if we holler loud enough, God have mercy on us. That God will have mercy. We need to be praying that. We need to pray that for our nation. How many people know that it's become a slang word for years? People will say, Lord, have mercy. Amen. 
But we need to be using that as a prayer. Lord, have mercy on the United States of America. I know she don't deserve it. I know she strayed from the founding fathers, uh, the vision they had for this country, and the foundation that it was built on. But have mercy. Have mercy on them. What do we need to pray for the backslidden they ought to see in church world? God, have mercy on them. I know that the churches we know today have turned aside to idols. They've turned aside to doctrines, doctrines of devils. But God, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, the same mercy that you've had on me, I pray for you to have on other people. Not to allow them more time to sin, but to give them more time to repent. Amen? Pray that God has mercy on them. Hallelujah. So he'll give them more time to get right. Mercy that his spirit will deal with them and draw them to an old-fashioned altar of repentance. Mercy so that they don't get... I know, you, well, they deserve it. They deserve it. Yeah, but so do you. You don't deserve mercy. You don't deserve grace. You don't deserve God's forgiveness. None of us deserve God's forgiveness. <clears throat> well, let's start praying, God, have mercy on their soul. Have mercy on their situation. Let mercy intervene. Now, see, mercy is for the guilty. <clears throat> you hear that? Mercy is for the guilty. No need for mercy if you're not guilty. The, de the very definition of mercy, what do we say it was? The very definition for mercy is the withholding of judgment that one deserves. Mercy. My, my, my. What about the servant in Matthew, the 18th chapter? Peter had just asked Jesus how many times should I forgive my brother? And it's Matthew 18 and 21. Peter said, Lord, how many times shall I, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. And Jesus turns to him. Of course, we all know the scripture and says, no, I say unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Then Jesus tells them this example. He says that the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. When he had begun to reckon, he would begin to figure out things, see who all owed him what. Amen. One was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now we've talked about this before. 10,000 talents was a whole lot of money. And the king here is going to throw him in debtor's prison, going to do something. What does this man do, this servant? What's he do? The servant fell down, I'm in mean, verse 26, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and he loosed him, and he forgave him of his debt. What happened here? Mercy. The Lord of this servant had mercy. The servant deserved judgment. The servant deserved to be put in prison. The servant deserved what he was about to get. Thank God for mercy. The servant deserved judgment. But he begs for mercy and what happens? The Lord, his master, gives him mercy. He forgives him all of his debt. And let's see what this, let's see what this joker does. It must have been Pentecostal. He forgave him of his debt, he says, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence now he goes out and he finds somebody that owes him a whole lot less than what he owed his master. <clears throat> and what's he do to him? He grabs hold of it. And he says, you're going to pay me what you owe me. And he asks him for mercy. He asks him, please. You know what he does? No. Why? Because he wasn't willing to extend to him the same mercy that his master extended to him. What are we talking about tonight? We're talking about mercy. He lays hands on him. He takes him. He throws him in prison. Then whenever this man that had been forgiven, where, where mercy had intervened on his behalf, when his Lord hears about it, well, then there's judgment to pay then because then it all comes back on him. Because, see, if you don't forgive your brother, you don't get forgiveness. That's exactly what happened to this man. He didn't forgive this man his debts, his debts that he owed him. 
So then that stopped his forgiveness from taking place. See, we shut up the bowels of compassion and the mercy of God whenever we refuse to have mercy on other people. I didn't write that. That's the Bible. Amen. We know that it says to either to, to forgive or you cannot be forgiven. Amen. It stops the forgiveness of God. What did Abraham do on Lot's behalf? Lot wasn't a bit more righteous at the state in the state that he was in, but Abraham goes out there on the hillside and he intercedes with God. What's he doing? He's crying out for mercy. Did Lot deserve it? The Bible says that Lot had vexed his righteous soul with the conversation, the filthy conversation of Sodom day by day and all that. We know what kind of backslidden state he was in. He offered his, his daughters to them men that night. He said, I said, here, take my daughters. Talk about being backslidden in a bad state. But Abraham out here on the hillside, God have mercy on him. And he, you know what he was saying. He was saying, peradventure, there's a few righteous. And he went on down the line there with numbers. But the point I want you to get is that he was out there on the hillside praying for mercy for Lot. Did Lot deserve it? No, 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 no. You see that whenever the angels go there and see what kind of shape Lot's in. But God has mercy. So if you're struggling tonight with what am I going to pray? People's asking me for me to pray for them. They're not in God's will. They're not living for God. They're not giving to God. They're not working for God. They're not doing anything. Pray for them that God will have the same mercy on them that he's had on you. Amen. <clears throat> pray for them that God will have the same mercy on them that he has had on you. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you a few scriptures then I'm going to close. Psalms 13 and 3. The Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. That's Psalms 13, 3 through 6. David rejoicing in the David knew something about God's mercy. Amen. He had experienced God's mercy firsthand. Right there in one of our favorite Psalms, Psalms 23. What's it end with? Psalms 23 and 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Honey, if you think that the only time you needed mercy is whenever you was a sinner and you needed to get saved and you fell down to the altar, you're wrong. You need mercy to be new for you every morning. His compassion's not to fail because without His mercy, without His compassion, without His forgiveness, without His love, we would be consumed. Amen? My Lord, stir up in us tonight a prayer that we'll pray for others that are going through trials and turmoil, not living for you, not caring about you, but that we would pray the same mercy that would intervene for them, that intervene for us whenever we deserve to hell. All of us need mercy. Psalms 52, 2 and 3. I will cry unto God most high and unto God that performeth all things for me. He will send from heaven. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Aren't you glad that God sent forth mercy when you deserve judgment? God sends you mercy. My, 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 Lord, help us to pray. God, have mercy on others the way that you've had mercy on me. I know you've been wanting to pray judgment down on people. Let's try something different. It's made you miserable. You're not happy spiritually. You feel you still feel that anger. You still feel that strife. Let's try something different starting tonight. Amen. Instead of praying anger down on something, instead of praying wrath down on somebody, let's pray the mercy of God down on something. The Bible says the goodness of the Lord leadeth to repentance. Amen. Let's pray that God blesses somebody into repentance. Let's pray that God allows mercy to give them a space of repentance to draw them, to allow His Spirit to draw them to a place of repentance before it's too late where they'll call out on his name. Let's pray for the mercy of God to move on people's lives instead of his judgment. Oh, my, my, my. Why? Because the same mercy he's had for us, other people need that as well. Go over there and read this. Just mark this down on your notes and read this after a while. Psalms 136, the whole chapter. And you'll find each one of these verses ends with this right here. For his mercy endureth forever. 
Verse 2 ends with his mercy endureth forever. Verse 3 ends with his mercy endureth forever. Verse 4 ends with his mercy endureth forever. Verse 5 ends with his mercy endureth forever. Verse 6 ends with his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. I think he's trying to tell us something. His mercy endureth forever. And that mercy is not just secluded to you. That mercy is extended to all of mankind that will turn to Him. To all of mankind that still have breath in their body, let's pray tonight that God will have mercy on them. Mercy and allow them a space to repent. Mercy and allow His Spirit to draw them to a place of repentance. That He'll have mercy on them. And that instead of getting the judgment that they deserve, they'll receive the grace that they don't deserve. Grace is the unmerited love and favor of God. You get that when judgment is deterred by God's mercy. When it's stopped by God's mercy. When you're standing there in judgment, in the judgment hall, and you deserve to be killed. Brother Rod, you deserve to split hell wide open. Your lawyer steps in with a briefcase full of mercy. <laughs> oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you throw yourself on the mercy of the Most High God. And grace intervenes and allows you to have favor, unmerited love, and favor of God. The same mercy that He has shown to us, we should pray for that same mercy to be shown to others. Never stop praying for somebody just because it seems like the more you pray, the worse they get. Just keep praying. Pray for God's mercy to allow the Spirit to deal with them longer, to draw them. Pray for God's mercy to give them another space, another chance to repent before it's eternally too late. Sure, that person deserves it. You're standing there with a stone in your hand saying they deserve to be stoned. That's easy for you to say when you're the one holding the rock. But when you're the one standing over there in front of the crowd, guilty, Kind of hard for you then to holler, hey, throw the stones. And all the end, you want mercy. And we should show others the same mercy that God has shown us. We should pray for others to receive the same mercy that God has shown to us. Matthew 5 and 7, as Jesus sits there on the mountain, He begins to teach them and preach them the Beatitudes. You know what He says? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You might want to rethink your judgmental ways. Amen. You might want to rethink the attitude that you've been having toward other people that's done you wrong and realize that we must forgive others. We must pray for others to have mercy, the same kind of mercy that God showed to us. We need to pray for Him to show to them. Because hell's eternal. Hell's an always thing. You can't erase that. Think about tonight the worst thing that anybody in this life has ever done to you. I know if I ask you, do you want that person to go to hell and suffer forever, you tell me no. So pray that God has mercy on them and saves them before it's too late. Pray that God has mercy on them and intervenes in their life before it's too late. The same mercy that He showed to you, pray that He shows to them.